Thank you for joining us here today as we continue this series. We're doing something a little different. We had been in the book of James for several weeks, and we said during Christmas what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some of the beloved Christmas carols that we sing, kind of pull out some of the meaning behind it, the history behind it, and some of the theology in it, because Christmas and Christmas songs in particular are just powerful. I mean, you can turn the radio on, you know, 94.1 or 94.5 or 95.1. You hear these Christmas songs. Many of them are just kind of happy, superficial. Uh, You know, grandma got run over by a reindeer. How theologically deep is that? Um, Like Santa Claus, all that, you know, it's, it's festive, but it's not really the meaning behind Christmas. But when we get into songs like we did last week, Joy to the World, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Now we're talking. Now there's some meat behind those words. And so uh, we looked last week at Luke chapter 2. We're going to continue in Luke chapter 2 because the Christmas story is found in two places in the New Testament. It's in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 1, and, and then it's in Luke chapter 2. And in Luke, Luke's account of uh, the Christmas story is the most detailed by far. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at Luke chapter 2, where the angels came to the shepherds. And we're going to see, in particular, three things that the angels did. And after the angels did these three things, the shepherds turned around and did the same three things. And I would build the case here today that we should do these same three things as worshipers of the Lord ourselves. So that's what we're going to look at here today as we look at Luke chapter 2. Now, Hark the Herald Angels Sing is our song this week. It was Joy to the World last week. And I just wanted to kind of go over the words. And by the way, at the end of the service, just before we're dismissed, we're all going to sing and uh, stand together and we're going to sing this song together, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. But I just want to go through a few of the words. Then I'll give you a little history about the song, and then we'll jump in to the scripture. The song goes, hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. I love this next part. God and sinners reconciled. That means at peace. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, that's what we're going to see today, the, an, the angelic hosts, their proclamation, hark, the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Hail the heaven-born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness, and I've seen that spelled both ways. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, I love this line, Born, referring to Christ's birth, that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. That's the gospel. Hark, the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Hark, the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. There it is again. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Glory to the newborn king. This song, believe it or not, was originally written in 1739 by a man named Charles Wesley. Charles was from England, and he came uh, from a family with a very famous older brother. His older brother's name was John Wesley. And John Wesley um, became the founder of what is known today as the Methodist Church. What's interesting about John Wesley is he and another man named George Whitfield came to the United States in the mid-1700s during a, a period of history what is known now by historians as the Great Awakening there was a massive revival in the United States of America in the 1700s, just prior to the Revolutionary War. And then, by the way, in the 1800s, 1840s, there was another Great Awakening called the Second Great Awakening, just prior to the Civil War. And so, Charles wrote this song in 1739. And when the song came, 
out. It was, it was not called Hark the Herald Angels Sing. It was originally called Hymn for Christmas Day. And the lyrics went, hark how all the Welkin rings. Welkin, W-E-L-K-I-N. We don't even know what that word means. I had to look it up. It means heaven. So what happened, like many songs, is over time and over the centuries, it got updated. The first update was in 1753 by um, George Whitfield, who was that kind of co-evangelist with John Wesley during the, the first Great Awakening. And then again in 1961, it went into a, a book of hymns and choruses, and that's the rendition that we sing here today. So that's kind of the history of the song. But let's get into where the song originated from, and that is Luke chapter 2, and we're going to look here at three things in particular the angels did what the angels said and did, and then three things that the shepherds said and did, and the the same three things we're to do. So Luke chapter 2, verses 10. But the angel reassures the shepherds, because the angel appears to the shepherds at night where they're tending their sheep. And of course, they're terrified. This massive being, glowing light, you know, shooting out his fingers, you know, and I don't know if angels have wings. I, I, I've never found that, I don't think, in the scripture. But nonetheless, well, actually, the seraphim, they do. The angels around the throne do. But they see this massive angel, and he tells them, don't be afraid. Why? I'm bringing you good news. Now, the word angel means messenger. And God sent angels right from Genesis all the way through Revelation, we see angels being sent by God for specific purposes. And often these purposes include a proclamation, a message from God taken by these angels, these messengers, these created spirit beings to earth. And they speak a language that humans understand directly a message from God. Probably the most famous encounter of an angel visiting a human being is when the angel Gabriel, one of the archangels, visited Mary, that teenage girl who became the mother of Jesus. So they come with a message. And the message from God is a blessing to God's people. Now, there also are judgment angels. We're not going to get into that. But angels come to proclaim a message to God's people directly from God. And here is the message that this angel proclaims that still has profound effects even in the 21st century. And here it is. The angel said, I'm bringing you good news that will bring great joy to all people. So this is good news that brings joy. That's why last week we looked at joy to the world. But what is this? And this is what we focused on last week, verse 11. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. So what was the good news? The good news is that although all of us are sinners, have broken God's commands, we're all guilty before God because of our sin. What's the good news? God is sending his son, born of the Virgin Mary, Father God Almighty, Mother Mary, this God child is being born in Bethlehem, the city of David, in accordance with all the prophecies. And the good news is that this child will be the Savior. What's he going to save us from? Our sins, eternal hell. He is what's known as the Messiah or the Christ or the anointed one from God. And he is the Lord. He's in charge. He's in control. That's the good news. The good news of the gospel that was proclaimed by the angel, that's proclaimed and shared by us to the world, is this. That there is hope for the world. I mean, sometimes you look at the news and you think there's no hope. We look what's going on with Hamas and Israel and the suffering and the murder and the war and the riots all over the world. We see what's been going on for nearly two years in Ukraine and we think, People just don't get along. We kill each other. We hate each other. We disagree with each other. Violence and riots and all this. There's a lot of bad news in the world. And most news stories, you figured this out, are bad news. That's what sells. And every now and then they'll stick a good story in there, right? Like they did with uh, Light Up the Night when Fox News came out. 
ABC Fox News came out. I haven't seen it yet, but we had uh, on Friday night an event called Light Up the Night. And we had over 700 people bring their children out that night. And it was just a great night. So there is good news in the world. Amen. Praise God for that. But most of what goes on in the world is bad news. People hurting each other and stealing from each other and killing each other and disagreeing with each other. And there's a lot of bad news. But God had a message for humanity that he sent through his messenger, the angel. And this is good news that's going to bring joy to everyone who listen. And that is this. That's what the song said too. You can be reconciled with God. You can have peace with the creator of the universe. That's good news. Peace with God. Are you at peace with God? When you lay your head on your pillow at night, is there like just calm on the inside because you don't feel ashamed, you don't feel guilty, you don't feel lost? You've got peace with God. You know, until you experience peace with God, you haven't really experienced peace. Until the world won't feel right. You'll never feel right on the inside until you're at peace with God. But here's the good news. Peace with God can be had, and it comes through this gift at Christmas that we celebrate, the birth of Christ. It comes through Christ because the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And by the way, shepherds, just to prove that this message is from God, you're going to see something very unusual. You're, you're going to see this sign. You're going to find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. What is a manger? A feed trough. Not something you see every day. You're going to go into Bethlehem. And remember, the shepherds were like the outcasts of society. They didn't bathe regularly. <laughs> They're out with stinky sheep all night. And, and the angel comes, not to the palace, not to people in Herod's palace, not to the governor, not to the powerful, not to the rich, not to the religious. He comes to the most lowly, the shepherds, with this message. Hey, shepherds, there's good news. The Messiah is coming. The Savior of the world is coming. And you're going to find him. And he's going to be born, not in a palace, but in a stable. And he's not going to be laid in an ornate crib. He's going to be laid in a feed trough with animal, animal slobber. But he's going to be wrapped in these little cloths. So that's how you're going to know. That's the Messiah. That's the gift. That's the Lord. That's baby Jesus, Savior. That's him. And suddenly... And here's the second thing the angels did. They shared the gospel. The second, the good news. And the second thing they did is they praised God for this good news, which is what we do here. Every Sunday we come and we praise God. We lift up, we laud, we applaud, we bless the name of God for what he has done. And suddenly, not just as one angel, but a vast amount, a horde, thousands of angels filled the sky. You know, this is before technology. This is before laser lights. This is like amazing. The whole sky lights up with these angelic choir, the armies of heaven. And what are they doing? Praising God. Can I tell you, when you have an experience with God through faith in Christ, there is just praise that's in gratitude that wells up within your heart. And you've got to give voice and expression to that. And the angels are doing that. This created order of beings, they're praising God for the good news and they can't believe it. Why would God come out of heaven? The son of God come out of heaven to earth, born as a lowly human being. I mean, this is amazing. Praise God for what he is doing. His work of redemption, and they praise God. And then the third thing they do is they glory, glorify God. They bring glory to God. I'm going to explain that in a minute. And they, say, they said this, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God 
is pleased. What does it mean to glorify God? They're saying glory to God, but when you glorify God, what you're doing is extolling his attributes. You are giving expression, saying words that magnify the majesty of the creator. His attributes like his faithfulness, his kindness, his mercy, his love, his strength, his holiness. And you began to give voice and glorify God. That's what the angels are doing for his attributes and praising him for his works. In particular now, his work and redemption by sending his son. To glorify God means to extol his attributes, to praise his works, to trust his name. And what does the name of Jesus mean? We explained this to you last week. Every time we say the name of Jesus, what are we saying? Jesus means Savior. Why? Because God will save his people from their sins. And finally, to glorify God means to obey his word. We bring glory to God by extolling his attributes, by praising him for his works, by trusting in his name, and by obeying his word. And you know the most important command to obey? The greatest commandment in all the Bible is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the most important. Are you doing that? Are you obeying that command? Are you obeying the command? Are you bringing glory to God with your life? Or are you living your life for your own glory? You see, when we come to faith in Christ and understand what the message the angels shared, the good news about Jesus, and we come by faith to Jesus, the scripture says in Colossians that we die and our life is now hidden with Christ and God. What does that mean? It's talking about physical death. We die to our way of living and we take upon ourselves a better way, God's way. Where we say, no longer am I going to live for myself and for my glory and for what I want to do. Jesus, you are now my Lord. I'm going to live for you and for your glory and for your honor. And we're at peace with God. But can I tell you? That's when living gets better, more meaningful, more purposeful, not so narcissistic and selfish. Now we are living for God's glory and not our own. We're living to obey his will and not our own. And it's a beautiful, wonderful, joyful thing. Not always easy, but always worth it. So let's go ahead and see here in verse 15 that the disciples, the disciples who are now shepherds, uh, they did the same thing. They did the same thing that the angels did. When the angels took the message from the throne of God to the shepherds and declared the good news that Jesus is coming and you're going to find him in Bethlehem and they praised God and they glorified God. Here's the reaction of the shepherds in verse 15. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, well, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And by the way, when they heard and saw the message, they saw the angels heard the message. They didn't wait. They didn't deliberate. They didn't twiddle their thumbs. They didn't ask other people's advice. They had seen and heard for themselves. And they directly, they immediately began to follow Jesus. Can I tell you that? When you hear God speak to you, when he moves on your heart, when faith rises up, and somehow you may not even intellectually understand it all, but somehow in your heart, you can see through the veil of all the religion and you know that God is real. And somehow... He's personal, meaning he knows you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to be your God. He wants your love 
and affection. He wants your obedience to his word. He wants to use your life to bring him glory. When you understand that, don't balk. Don't try to figure it out. Just follow. Do what the shepherds did. What did they immediately do? Verse 16, they hurried to the village and they found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. It was true. It wasn't just make believe. It wasn't just our imagination. It wasn't just, we had bad pizza last night. What the angel said is true. There's the baby in Bethlehem in a feed trough. That is the Messiah. It's true. When they believed it was true and when they hurried and experienced Jesus, even as a little baby for themselves, they did the same three things that the angels did. The first thing is this, is they shared the message with others. Look at this. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. Listen, when you come to faith in Christ and you experience for yourself that it's real, God is real, Jesus Christ is real, and you're born of the Spirit, and you get this new life, don't think you have to go to Bible school or understand everything in the Bible to tell anybody else what's going on. Just share what Christ did for you and share it with everybody. We used to sing a Christmas song, go tell it on the mountain. Just let people know, here's what the Lord did for me. Share it. Sometimes when people first come to Christ and it's like, I, I believe this whole time it was just a bunch of religion. Christians were a bunch of hypocrites. I could just see all the problems with it, but I didn't know like God really was real and really loved me. But when I experienced that, when by faith I came to Christ and my sins were washed away and I got that new heart alive unto God and I wanted to follow God and serve God, I just couldn't shut up about it. That's good. Don't share with everybody what he's done. He's good. Let people know. And that's what the shepherds did. They immediately went out. They shared with everybody what happened. And everybody was like, whoa, you guys drank the Kool-Aid. You've been around them sheep too long. They were a marvel. They were astonished. And what did they do? The same thing the angels did. And the shepherds went back to their flocks. So they went back to work. You know, when you come to Christ, you don't become a hermit. Oh, you don't have to go up and live on a mountain all by yourself and, you know, do your alms. No, you go back to school. You go back to work. Go back to your hobbies. You go back to your family. But you're different. In one sense, you're the same. You look in the mirror, you got the same face. You didn't lose 10 pounds when you got saved. What changed? Your heart became alive unto God. Now you have a desire. I want to know him. I want to please him. I want to follow him. Lord, help me know what this means, but I feel so good. And they went back to their flocks, back to their work, but here's what they're doing now. Now they're glorifying God. Now their life is about something greater. The king of kings. They're not the king of their life anymore. They're glorifying the king of kings. They're living. Do not just extol their own attributes, but to extol the savior. To bring him praise. To do his work. To obey his word. It's new. And then they did the third thing here, and that is they glorified and they praised God for all they had heard and seen. You know, until somebody for themselves hears the gospel and sees what Christ has done for them and understands, you can't really get them to witness, share, 
But as soon as somebody experiences, and I've been using that word a lot today because when by faith we come to Christ, there is a change. The Bible said, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You're changed. Again, not outwardly, inwardly. You get a heart that wants to know God. You have a desire to learn about him and his word. You have a desire to share what God has done for you with all your friends, with all your family, with everybody you care about. You just want them to know too. It's marvelous. It's miraculous. It's wonderful. I wonder, have you put your trust in the Savior? Do you have joy in your life because you've experienced the good news of the gospel? When that happens, everything else in life takes on a new meaning. Jesus said it this way. He said, you get born again. Those are Jesus' words, not from the hippies in the 70s. You get born again. Remember when he was talking to Nicodemus about that? John chapter 3. A religious leader, a very smart man, good man, Nicodemus, comes to Jesus at night. He didn't want to be seen with Jesus in the daytime. And he said, Jesus, We know that you're a man from God. We know you're from God because nobody could be doing the miracles you're doing. What was he doing? Opening the eyes of the blind, the deaf were hearing, the lame were walking, the dead were coming to life. I mean, feeding people, healing, helping the poor. Nobody could do the miraculous stuff you're doing unless God were with them. You know how Jesus answered that question? I think you're from God, right? Because nobody could do it. Jesus said this. Here's how he answers that. He saw that Nicodemus had a curiosity about God. And here's what he tells him. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nobody can see the kingdom of God, heaven, eternal life. Nobody, unless he's born again. Nicodemus, a smart man, religious man, he's a lawyer. He's a Pharisee. He's like, I don't get it. What do you mean born again? How in the world am I going back in my mother's womb? I'm a full grown man. I ain't going back in my mother's womb and being born again. What are you talking about? And Jesus said that which is born of flesh is flesh. In other words, yeah, there's a natural birth. We were all born through our mothers. But there's another birth. It's a spiritual birth. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit spirit. You shouldn't marvel that I'm saying you must be born again. And then he uses an illustration. It's quite perfect. He said the wind. You look at the wind. Can you see the wind? Now, I mean, you see the effects of the wind. You see the trees blowing. Tonight and tomorrow, we're going to see the snow blowing. (laughs) You see the effects of the wind, but can you see wind? No. But can you feel it? Oh, yeah. Feel it when it blows across your face? Yeah. And Jesus said, that's what it's like with this spiritual birth. Can't see it. But you'll feel it. You'll feel it in here. Friend, I wonder, have you ever felt that? Have you come alive spiritually? Have you had a spiritual birth? You say, well, how does that happen? That same context in John 3, Jesus uses probably the most famous 
verse in the Bible. You've seen it at football games and basketball games held up on signs, John 3, 16, right? It's really simple. It's a gift from God. It's a work of God. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, is the message of Christmas, his only begotten son, Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, get this, everlasting life. And that God kind of life begins now when by faith you come to Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? I wonder if there's anyone in here today. Maybe there's several of you. And as I'm describing the new birth that Jesus talked about and sharing with you as the angels did and then the shepherds did and as we should do, share the good news with others. I wonder if you've had that experience where you've been born again. Or is God just a, you know, something in your mind? Yeah, I believe he's out there somewhere. But maybe you didn't know you could know him, experience him, call on him, be saved, have this birth spiritually. What do I need to do? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, what is that? Believe. It means you place your trust in him. That he is the savior. That he'll save you from your sins. That he is the Messiah, the anointed one from God, the son of God who gave his life on the cross to pay for your sins. And that he is Lord. He's in control. He deserves the glory. What do you do? You put your trust in him. And say, Jesus, I believe. I put my faith in you. Forgive my sin. All of it. Save me. Save me. Heal me. Make me your child. If you want to do that, I encourage you to pray this prayer with me right now. Let's call on them together. Dear God in heaven, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. That he was born in Bethlehem and laid in a manger. And that he grew and lived his life in obedience to you so that he could die on the cross to pay for my sins. Jesus, forgive my sins. Be my Lord and my Savior. I want to be born again. I want the gift of eternal life. I put my trust in you. Save me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We just pray for you right now. Father, I pray for everyone many for the first time that sincerely put their faith, their trust in you, Jesus. I pray that Christ would be formed in them, that they would understand how much you love them. I pray, God, that they would learn and grow in their faith. And thank you so much for the message of Christmas, the Savior coming into the world. We want to share you with everyone, Lord, and like the angels and like the shepherds, we want to glorify your name and praise your name for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.